Hello and welcome to Ear Read This. My name's Ash and you join me today for an episode all about Metamorphosis, perhaps the best known work by Franz Kafka. In this short story, Gregor Samsa, a travelling salesman, awakes to discover he has been transformed into a... Uh, well, we'll get to that later. Hindered by his transformation, his attempts to communicate with his family and his chief clerk are to no avail. In his creaturely condition, he can only scare and repulse them. Having previously supported the household, Gregor is shut up in his room and abandoned by his father, mother and sister, who undergo a transformation of their own in response. Eventually, Gregor dies from a wound in his back caused by an apple his father threw at him. Kafka began work on Metamorphosis, or Die Verwandlung, in 1912, and it was published three years later during the First World War. The throbbing claustrophobia, paranoia, and incipient betrayal in the story seems an anxiety befitting the times, especially for a German-speaking Jew living in an increasingly anti-Semitic Prague. But Kafka was not one for letting the real world intrude too much into his writings. His famous diary entry of the 2nd of August 1914 reads, Germany has declared war on Russia swimming in the afternoon. As Saul Friedlander says, mainly Kafka was the poet of his own disorder. Domestic disorder is terrible enough, and Metamorphosis was, his author admitted, exceptionally repulsive. He wrote to Felice Bauer that he wished to read it to her, but if he did, I would have to hold your hand, for the story is a little frightening. It is called Metamorphosis, and it would thoroughly scare you. The monstrous, polymorphic reputation of Kafka's work could be enough to scare off anyone. Stories that are designed for readers willing to let their imagination carry them through will always attract the most fanatical decoders, and there is no shortage of theories of what metamorphosis is truly supposed to mean. The shape of its meaning transforms with each study. It is an attack on his father, another one. It is a fantasy of a repressed sadomasochist, the self-abnegation of an atheistic Jew, the self-loathing of a secret homosexual, a desperate plea for the rest of his family to keep it down as he tried to write, and so on. Contrary readings of Kafka have led to the watering down of the term Kafkaesque, which along with its distant relative that went into movies, Lynchian, have opened up like two enormous umbrellas to cover anything not absolutely straightforward. We'll touch on some theories posited by Kafkologists over the years, but I chiefly would like today's episode to be completed in the spirit of Michael Hoffman's sentiments, as found here in the introduction to his 2007 translation. Kafka remains, I hope, an author to be read, not someone for the experts. Unlike any of the other moderns, he is not preceded by his own foothills. You need undergo no training to prepare for him. So, without further ado, let's jump in right at the first line. When Gregor Samsa awoke one morning from troubled dreams, he found himself changed into a... Into a what? In the copy I've been reading, Hoffman translates Gregor into a monstrous cockroach. In previous English versions, he usually woke up as a gigantic insect. Vermin is closer to the German original, Ungeheures Ungetziefer. According to translator Stanley Korngold, Ungetziefer derives, as Kafka probably knew, from the late Middle High German word originally meaning the unclean animal not suited for sacrifice. The uncleanliness of the animal is reinforced by Gregor being called by the unruffled charwoman employed by the Samsa household an old dung beetle. Even stronger, he is described at one point as being merely a giant brown stain on the flowered wallpaper. The precise biology of Kafka's unfortunate subject is kept intentionally vague. However, this didn't stop Vladimir Nabokov from trying to work it out. Nabokov read the tale of Gregor as that of a man whose human instincts begin to mingle with his newfound insect ones. Being a famous lepidopterist and enthusiastic taxonomist, Nabokov wasn't going to let Gregor escape until he had neatly pinned him down along with the other beasties in his cabinet. What insect? he asked, peering at Gregor's many squirming legs. Commentators say cockroach, which of course does not make sense. A cockroach is a vermin that is flat in shape with large legs, and Gregor is anything but flat. He is convex on both sides, belly and back, and his legs are small. He approaches a cockroach in only one respect. His coloration is brown. That is all. Apart from this, he has a tremendous convex belly divided into segments and a hard rounded back suggestive of wing cases. 
In beetles, these cases conceal flimsy little wings that can be expanded and then may carry the beetle for miles and miles in a blundering flight. Curiously enough, Gregor the beetle never found out that he had wings under the hard covering of his back. To lend credence to Nabokov's insistence on a taxonomy for Gregor, Kafka does include some specific details. We discover that he has many legs, powerful jaws that ooze a brown fluid, and a belly sprinkled with white dots. Nevertheless, we reduce the effect of Gregor's transformation the further we attempt to complete the picture of it. The glancing references slithering in and out of the text suggest the ideal way to experience the physicality of this metamorphosis, as one might view an enormous and impossible creature as sections of its body lumber past our windows. Kafka himself did refer privately to Samsa as an insect, but insisted that if his story must be illustrated, it should not depict a cockroach or a beetle, but a man lying in bed. From all of this, we can deduce that Kafka wanted to keep the exact nature of Gregor's transformation under wraps, that instead of visualising Gregor as an animal, we should feel that he is vermin. And if he is vermin, what, we are compelled to ask, has Gregor done to deserve such a fate? To use an acting term, Gregor is discovered, already metamorphosed, that is to say, we see nothing of his life before his transformation. This sets us scuttling over the cramped surfaces of his bedroom and his story from the word go. Why? Well, it's in our training. Just as any story that smacks of Aesop will have us scratching out a moral, a character who has undergone a transformation immediately suggests a causal relationship between their inner and outer lives. Ovid shows us characters before their metamorphoses to familiarise us with the part of their behaviour or history that will be matched with their newfound hairy or ugly exterior. Cocky weavers will be turned into spiders, transgressing hunters into stags to be torn apart by their own dogs. Whether or not the transformation is deserved is another matter. What we understand from Ovid's metamorphoses is that they are changes following an internal logic. So Kafka puts us ill at ease by initially denying us any context to his own metamorphosis, which is why we nervously start probing any loose floorboards, trying to understand what Gregor has done in his past to deserve this punishment. That is, if it is punishment. We cannot help noticing that despite the fact that Gregor has woken up on the wrongest of all possible sides of the bed, his reaction is fairly temperate. He takes it in his many-legged stride and finds it largely a nuisance that he'll be late for work. His immediate intention was to get up calmly and leisurely, to get dressed, and above all, to have breakfast before deciding what to do next, because he was quite convinced he wouldn't arrive at any sensible conclusions as long as he remained in bed. This sounds more like a man waking up in the midst of an arresting worry, not the body of an insect. Even as the particulars of his condition are made plain to him, he remains unshakably terrestrial. Unfortunately, it appeared he had no teeth as such. What was he going to grip the key with? The formulation of terrible situation followed by banality is reminiscent of that diary entry of Kafka's I quoted earlier. Germany has declared war on Russia, swimming in the afternoon. It appears my teeth have gone, what am I going to grab the key with? Part of the humour of metamorphosis comes from the very human bathos of Gregor's mindset. In extraordinary circumstances, Gregor has the most ordinary of thoughts. But his very human and ordinary thoughts of breakfast and not being late for work seem somehow more repulsive than his insect carapace. What we see of the human part of Gregor is an unimaginative, selfish and scared little critter. We allow ourselves to believe that in challenging times, say when confronted with mortality or transformed into an insect, we will draw from some species well of strength, face the time with dignity and fortitude. What Gregor's condition suggests is that no, the dying are selfish and small-minded too, justifiably even more so perhaps. And their desperate clinging on to the human world, the world of the living, is just as sickening to witness as Gregor trying to cling on to the door handle with his insect mandibles. The implacable acceptance with which Gregor greets his judgment conjures and combines the conditions of reality and dream, a fusion that Kafka perfected long before the Surrealists came along and tried it themselves. If your teeth start crumbling or dropping out of your head in a dream, you are dismayed but not surprised. Some preoccupation of your subconscious has warned you that this is a fate that you richly deserve. So when it happens out there in your twisting dreamscape and you are feeling your slimy little teeth popping like lumps of sand, you might be horrified, but you don't respond with the reasonable disbelief you would if it happened at work. It is useless to ask ourselves if of Kafka's writing, is this a dream or did it really happen? It is both or it is neither. 
Kafka combines the tyranny and torture of dreams with a hyperrealism that feels resolutely conscious and undreamlike. The strangeness of Gregor's condition is not reflected on that much, and Kafka writes as if the mechanics of being an insect were already second nature to him. Take this. And so he scurried along in front of his father, pausing when he stopped, and hurrying on the moment he made another movement. Not how a terrified son would flee his parent on the attack, but rather how a cockroach might intermittently scuttle away as you approached it. If the acceptance of his fate does have some origin in dreams, then we can conclude that in some fashion, Gregor believes he deserves this punishment. But what has he done? John Updike wrote that Kafka epitomises one aspect of the modern mindset, a sensation of anxiety and shame whose centre cannot be located and therefore cannot be placated. The cause of Gregor's shame is, as we might expect, not made explicit. Kafka was consumed with the sense of his own shame and uncleanliness, writing to Milena Jizenska in 1920 that I am dirty, Milena, infinitely dirty. This is why I scream so much about purity. No one sings as purely as those who inhabit the deepest hell. What we take to be the song of angels is their song. The dirtiness in the Samsa household seems to derive from sin, indeed original sin, if we take the cue from the fatal apple lobbed at Gregor by his father. Before that, Gregor wakes up with an itching belly. The area has a sprinkling of white dots that he can't explain. The highlighting of these dots as unexplainable, while the other transformations of his body are quite placidly accepted, points to Gregor, even in his insect form, as being sick already and the white dots forecast the ring of dust that will settle around the mouldy apple lodged in Gregor's back. Are the white dots then an insectoid manifestation of a human sickness that he has brought with him through his transformation? Well, to really push this, and I humbly acknowledge the possibility that Gregor is just a beetle with white spots on his tummy, the itch on the inside of his belly could be diagnosed as a symptom of a sickness which will be brought humiliatingly into view via the wound in his convex back in the mirror position, in other words, of his itchy white sprinkles. The private wound will not remain private for long. To quote Milan Kundera, the Kafkan is not restricted to either the private or the public domain. It encompasses both. The public is the mirror of the private. The private reflects the public. So if Gregor's exterior is the mirror of his private life, in what way has he made himself vermin? Vermin, like cockroaches, manifest in places of disrepair and abandonment, and Gregor's moderate response to his transformation soon sounds quite in character. We hear from his mother that that boy has nothing but work in his head. It almost worries me that he never goes out on his evenings off. He's been in the city now for the past week, but he spent every evening at home. He sits at the table quietly, reading the newspaper or studying the railway timetable. His only hobby is a little occasional woodwork. Resisting the temptation to dwell on the significance of Gregor whittling wood into other forms, the impression we get of him is of a young man stagnated by work, living a dull, automated life in the family home. We'll get to the role of the family and themselves and Gregor's status as breadwinner in due course. For now, we have maybe a case for an Ovidian logical metamorphosis. Gregor, the myopic, sedentary young man, has been singularly infested with a cockroach or ungutzifer. The mouldiness of his wound cements the feeling of terminal lethargy, as does its eventual effect on his potential for movement. Even if Gregor had lost his mobility, and presumably for good, so that now, like an old invalid, he took an age to cross his room, there could be no more question of crawling up out of the horizontal. So his failure to leave the family home has been punished with this terminal paralysis. And if Gregor's shame or sin is not spreading his wings, setting out on his own, developing independently, his fate is then an ironic inversion of the caterpillar's own metamorphosis. Instead of turning into a butterfly, he's turned into the equivalent of a chrysalis with legs. If so, perhaps the curiosity that Nabokov had, that Gregor never discovers the wings he has in his back, isn't so strange, but rather a critical point. As his insect self takes over, Gregor has barely time to dwell upon what he might miss from the human world. Besides the framed picture he has that he is attached to on his wall, what he is inspired most by is his sister's violin playing. Could he be an animal to be so moved by music? It was as though he sensed a way to the unknown sustenance he'd longed for. Some have pointed at an incestuous desire within our dirty little insects, but one gets from the extracts such as the above 
more of a sense of Gregor's abandoning his creative passions, the unknown sustenance being a road he has not taken somewhere, a portion of his life he is allowed to fall into disrepair. He notices this all too late and only during his punishment, in some small way perhaps justifying his punishment altogether. Kafka certainly had a fixation with punishment, as the readings of him as a sadomasochist belie, as well as his own letters. Yes, torturing is extremely important to me. I am preoccupied with nothing but being tortured or torturing. The stupidity inherent in this, realisation of stupidity doesn't help, I once expressed as follows. The animal wrenches the whip from the master and whips itself so as to become master, and doesn't realise that it is only a fantasy caused by a new knot in the master's thong. Whether or not lethargy or creative abandonment was the sin, Gregor's punishment is certainly not entirely bridled against. Early on, we get a completely opposite impression. Gregor dropped with a short cry onto his many little legs. No sooner had this happened than, for the first time that morning, he felt a sense of physical well-being. The little legs had solid ground under them. They obeyed perfectly, as he noticed to his satisfaction, even seeking to carry him where he wanted to go, and he was on the point of believing a final improvement in his condition was imminent. Early on, he expects there to be a final improvement, but uh, eventually Gregor will think of his destruction as entirely necessary, finding in his fantastic transformation a kind of redemption, something purged. What he didn't have was his author's ability to do so through writing. Who knows, the more I write, and the more I liberate myself, the cleaner and worthier of you I may become, but no doubt there is a great deal more to get rid of. Kafka's biographer, or one of them, Nicholas Murray, comments on this saying, the use of the word cleaner, reiner, suggests that he felt he was e evacuating something dark from himself in the writing. The apple in Kafka's back, it seemed, could be scooped out onto the page, unlike poor Gregor's. A fine wound is all I have brought into the world, says the patient in another Kafka story, The Country Doctor. And in Metamorphosis, Gregor's wound in his back is only the smaller sibling to the wound he has become in the body of his family. Kafka wrote the following to his sister some years after the publication of Metamorphosis. In the family, clutched in the tight embrace of the parents, there is room only for certain kinds of people who conform to certain kinds of requirements. If they do not conform, they are not expelled, that would be very fine, but it is impossible, for we are dealing with an organism here, but are cursed or consumed or both. Life in the Samsa household has been, if not happy, at least placid. Gregor supports the family in his work as a travelling salesman, his father lies in his dressing gown, feebly buried in his bed, cared for by Gregor's old asthmatic mother and his sister. When his metamorphosis occurs, Gregor is placed metaphorically and zoologically at the bottom of the food chain, and in the ensuing power vacuum, the family undergoes a metamorphosis of its own. Really? Really? Was that still his father? Who on his infrequent walks? on one or two Sundays per year, walked between Gregor and his wife, bundled into his old overcoat, feeling his way forward with his carefully jabbing stick. Now here he was, fairly erect, wearing a smart blue uniform with gold buttons like the doorman of a bank. Over a stiff collar of his coat, the bulge of a powerful double chin. Under the busy eyebrows, an alert and vigorous expression in the, his black eyes. More than a podcast's worth could be carped away on Kafka and Fathers, not to mention Kafka and Judaism. To compound the two in one quote, here's an intriguingly worded letter from the author to his friend Max Brode. Most young Jews who wanted to write German wanted to leave Jewishness behind them, and their fathers approved of this vaguely. This vagueness was what was outrageous to them. But with their posterior legs, they were still glued father's Jewishness, and with their waving anterior legs, they found no new ground. The ensuing despair became their inspiration. Let us for now remain with domestic despair, the despair of an adult failing to mature in his own time, in his own space, but remaining in the family home and rotting just like the fruit in his back. His betrayal by his family is sudden and cruel. At first, only his sister visits him, and she only to leave a bowl of food. Only briefly does Gregor entertain revenge. And then he wasn't in the mood to worry about the family, but instead was filled with rage at how they had neglected him, 
and even though he couldn't imagine anything for which he had an appetite, he made schemes as to how to inveil himself into the pantry and tear what was rightfully his, even if he didn't feel the least bit hungry now. This feeling is passing. For the most part, his attitude remains along these lines. Gregor was still here, and wasn't thinking at all about leaving the family. Despite the fact that his new interests as an insect, climbing at walls and hanging off them, might make the outside world more attractive, he makes no attempt to flee. Instead, he remains, becomes wounded, and eventually dies. His conviction that he needed to disappear was, if anything, still firmer than his sister's. Meanwhile, his sister and father have been at work, and the household has been rented out to three businessmen. The transformation of his father is the most noticeable. An inversion of the lethargy theme can be found in the following. With an odd stubbornness, his father now refused to take off his uniform coat when he was at home, while his dressing gown hung uselessly on its hook. The family initially respond with the horror you would reasonably expect from people discovering their relative has been transformed into a giant insect. But subsequently, he's demoted from extraordinary creature to ordinary vermin. Soon, this is how his mother is discussing how to keep his room. Isn't it the case as well that by taking away his furniture, we would be showing him that we are abandoning all hope of an improvement in his condition, and leaving him utterly to his own devices? I think it would be best if we try to leave the room in exactly the condition it was before, so that, if Gregor is returned to us, he will find everything unaltered and will thereby be able to forget the intervening period almost as if it hadn't happened. As he listened to these words of his mother, Gregor understood that the want of any direct human address, in combination with his monotonous life at the heart of the family over the past couple of months, must have confused his understanding, because otherwise he would not have been able to account for the fact that he had seriously wanted his room emptied out. Was it really his wish to have his cosy room comfortably furnished with old heirlooms, transformed into a sort of cave, merely so that he would be able to crawl around in it freely? without hindrance in any direction, even at the expense of rapidly and utterly forgetting his human past. Here, his desire for freedom and his treatment as vermin share an ironic symbiosis. Only in insect form does Gregor realise how much he wished to be free of old heirlooms. Soon the family stop visiting him altogether, and instead the old Shah woman begins cleaning his room, a woman completely unfazed by Gregor's appearance. Far from being something once human, she starts to view him as a surprisingly developed insect, and when discovering his corpse, quote, she thought he was lying there immobile on purpose and was playing at being offended. In her opinion, he was capable of all sorts of understanding. When Gregor surprises the guests and his family, desperately craving to listen to his sister's violin playing, the guests react not with the horror of a people confronted with a monster, but with the annoyance of tenants discovering their room has damp or bugs, and immediately they turn from Gregor to remonstrate with his father about what he is charging them. Gregor, it seems, has shrunk, if not in dimensions, then at least in impact. The outside world, too, has faded away from him. For it is true to say that with each passing day, his view of distant things grew fuzzier. The hospital across the road, whose ubiquitous aspect he had once cursed, he no longer even saw. And if he hadn't known for a fact that he lived in the leafy but perfectly urban Charlottenstrasse, he might have thought that his window gave on to a wasteland, where the grey sky merged indistinguishably with grey earth. Despite Gregor's dismal fate, there remains something funny about Metamorphosis. This travelling salesman, who will be confined for the majority of the story to his room, travelling only on its floor, and eventually losing the ability to travel altogether, and selling only his condition through the door as something not to worry about, before finally giving up on both. Milan Kundera makes the point that a joke is only a joke if you're outside of it. By contrast, the Kafkan takes us inside, into the guts of a joke, into the horror of the comic. And that's where we'll have to leave it for today. Um, thank you very much for listening to this first um, first short story episode. If you've enjoyed the um, the podcast, uh, please um, show your support by uh, subscribing on iTunes, liking us on Facebook, finding us on Instagram, all of the usual stuff. We will be back next week with a very special um, double feature. So stay tuned for that. And uh, in the meantime, happy reading. Mm -hmm.